Back, Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, and I call Trevor Lunn. Speaker, question number one. I call the Minister. Uh, with your permission, Mr Speaker, I wish to group questions one and five together. I want to ensure that Northern Ireland plays its part in minimising greenhouse gas emissions and to tackle climate change head on. I am committed to Northern Ireland having its very own climate change legislation to achieve this, but we do not need just any bill. We need the right evidence-based climate change bill that sets out an achievable pathway for Northern Ireland to contribute to the wider UK and global efforts for greenhouse gas emission reductions. I therefore intend to bring before the Assembly an alternative climate change bill to the Private Members Bill, a bill which is actually strongly evidence-based, that is better for Northern Ireland and which will provide a high-quality piece of legislation, seeking to get those proposals on the agenda for an executive meeting since uh, 24th of March 2021, and this is yet to happen. My officials are currently working with the Office of Legislative Council and are very well advanced on the drafting of a climate change bill on my proposals. I therefore intend to circulate my draft bill and accompany explanatory uh, and financial memorandum to the executive colleagues. And once that is secured, I proceed uh, to proceed, I intend to and prepared to quickly move to the right climate change bill. It is important that carbon leakage is taken into account when setting emission reduction targets, so we do not inadvertently displace emissions to other jurisdictions. And in some situations, such leakage could result in higher levels of overall emissions due to practices in other jurisdictions potentially not being as sustainable as those in Northern Ireland. In that context, the agri-food sector, for which my department has sectoral responsibility, aiming for a net zero target by 2045 presents an increased risk of carbon leakage. The CCC, in recommending an emissions reduction target of at least 82 per cent for Northern Ireland by 2050, took account of the importance of the Northern agri-food sector and the fact that around 50 per cent of NI produce is exported to other parts of the United Kingdom. So whilst the targets such as net zero carbon by 2045 may stimulate some sectors, the issue of carbon leakage is extremely pertinent for the agri-food sector, and in their analysis for Northern Ireland, the CCC felt that, based on current knowledge, meeting net zero carbon by 2050 would require such a significant reduction in livestock production, particularly in beef and dairy sectors, that it does not present a viable option. Okay, we're well over two minutes, Chair. Apologies, just to remind you. So, Trevor Lund, supplementary. Yes, I, I thank the minister for his answer. I think the, the answer was yes, actually. But uh, can I ask him, did, in terms of the present climate bill that's going through the Assembly, did he have cited this bill before it was made public? Did he have any input into it at that stage? No, I have not input into uh, the private member's bill, um, and the private member's bill wasn't consulted upon uh, with the public in the first instance. And there are um, serious flaws within the private member's bill, so leaving aside uh, the issues that I have outlined in terms of uh, not taking the independent advice uh, that is provided, the independent expert advice, and simply um, latching on to what is happening in other jurisdictions uh, where there is not a direct uh, interchange, <coughs> then that, that, that actually leads to very significant flaws in the private member's bill. So I wish there to be a climate change uh, legislation. I wish that legislation um, can actually make a, a real and tangible difference. The problem is, if we simply introduce legislation which translates the beef that is produced uh, in Northern Ireland or the dairy that is produced uh, in Northern Ireland to, for example, South America, where you are going to be cutting down trees to produce that beef, it will do more harm to the environment. So, Jumping up and down here, pretending you're doing something for the environment whenever what you're actually doing is entirely counterproductive is not a wise way forward, in my opinion. William Irwin, supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for his response? Uh, could the Minister outline other risks uh, that he has envisaged, envisaged in the result of not zero by 2045? Well, first of all, there is the risk at home of job losses in the agri food sector. So it employs over 100,000 people, well over 100,000 people. And if you take 50% of the beef reduction and 50% dairy reduction, which is the two largest part of the sector, then you're going to have job losses. So, for example, County Tyrone is a hub 
for agri-food. We have many large factories there. Uh, that is going to lead to job losses. That is going to um, have an impact on the regional balance of our economy. So it is going to have a dis disproportionate impact upon rural communities, uh, particularly in, in the west of Northern Ireland. And going beyond the natural rate of stock turnover would also lead to the premature scrappage of assets, so high quality um, dairy cows, for example, and, and, and beef, beef cows um, may have to be uh, slaughtered at a much earlier age, and therefore that is not a benefit to the environment. Um, we are looking at a potential of increased prices due to the loss of control in production and the importation of, of so much goods potentially lower welfare standards and the quality of imported goods being of a lesser standard than what we have at home here, the potential for increased transport emissions depending on the means of transport um, into the country. So, for example, uh, it is not, the, not the, the transport and shipping terms from South America to here. It is the fact that that meat may have been hauled for thousands of miles to get to the port. And the loss of support from the, the very sectors and those who rely upon it, who we need to actually achieve emission reductions, and a failure to meet legislative carbon tar budget targets from early on, resulting in a loss of momentum and detracting from any positive um, progress that is made. And finally, the sheer cost of achieving net zero by 2045, as opposed to an 82 per cent reduction by 2050, with the ability to actually increase that. If the science allows us to increase it, I call Philip McGuigan. Uh, can call you, uh, and Minister. Notwithstanding the fact that it was a commitment within the NDNA, uh, my colleague uh, and chair of the Agriculture, Environment, and Rural Affairs Committee, Declan McGillier, brought forward a, a motion asking for you to introduce a climate bill almost a year ago. Uh, and the current private members' bill uh, in motion and supported by this assembly is a response, Minister, of your failure to act on this issue. So, given the very important issue at stake, and given the very uh, time frame, an extremely tight time frame in nature on this issue, would the minister not agree that the time, uh, his time, would be better spent uh, engaging with the existing bill rather than attempting to belatedly bring forward uh, his own bill? Well, it demonstrates uh, <coughs> the desperation of those who are, are trying to undermine me, and who have been sitting on my bill. From the 24th of, of March, so I, I've had a paper with the executive on the 24th of March. I'm now going to provide them a full copy of the bill, so they have absolutely no excuses to move this forward. So the legislation is, is, is there. That'll be going before the executive, and that'll be legislation that's number one consulted on. Number two, work has been done on the actual costs. You know, we can produce a, a Disney World bill from anywhere and put it out there and say this is what's good for Northern Ireland. But it will not be Disney World whenever the farmers in West Tyrone are driven off the hills because they don't want their beef, they can't produce their beef because of a climate change bill that Sinn Féin has supported. I hope you will be able to go back to North Antrim and tell the farmers in North Antrim that they are not needed anymore because Sinn Féin want to back a climate bill which has not went through the regular processes of consultation, which has not been costed and which has not taken the independent advice that is available. Instead of that, you should be backing me and supporting me and bringing forward legislation. I said I could not bring legislation forward in three months because I have to go through a consultation process. That was accurate. The fact that another bill was rushed leads to rushed legislation, and rushed legislation has always got a label of bad legislation. I call John Blair. I thank the Minister for his answers and the confirmation that he does indeed intend to bring forward the said bill. Can, can I ask in that regard if, uh, as part of the bill brought forward by the Minister, there will be specific emissions for target, targets for the agricultural sector? And if so, what support would be envisaged for that sector in order to assist it meeting those targets? The bill that we will bring forward will have targets and will identify where those targets can be achieved. And <clears throat> Northern Ireland has made substantial progress uh, in terms of um, transport, in terms of energy and can make uh, substantial progress in terms of agri-food. You know, farmers are actually bought into doing this. The agri-food sector is bought into doing it. So Cranswick Pork Factory, for example, is, is now operating net zero. So people have a total commitment to achieving this. Why are we actually looking at those people and saying, yeah, you're committed to helping, but we're not interested in working with you uh, to ensure that you have an industry? 
uh, in the future. We need to ensure that we bring people with us in a way which sustains jobs, sustains the economy, puts food on people's tables. Because you know, we all say we might not have a planet in, in, in a number of years. We will not have a life if we do not have food on our tables. So food production is one of the most important tasks anywhere in the world. And I am, for one, I'm not prepared to take the quality food production that exists in Northern Ireland and offset that in some other part of the world where they have lower animal welfare standards, they have lower worker standards, they have lower carbon standards, and then we say, oh, what, what good boys are we? Because we are not producing the carbon, but we are using the material where the carbon has been produced at an even higher level than it would have been had we used material produced here in Northern Ireland. I call Steve Egan. And may I thank the Minister for his comments so far. Uh, Minister, yourself and the Economy Minister have uh, asked for Sir Peter Kendall to do a review on agribusiness in Northern Ireland. Sir Peter Kendall was very clear when he says this is not about a zero-sum option for agriculture, but it is about being smarter. Will the Minister and whoever is going to be the new Economy Minister, will he actually commit to uh, taking the recommendations for this and, imp and implementing them in full? We, will, uh, we didn't uh, uh, take on Peter Kendall to do a course of work, uh, not to give due regard to the recommendations that is made. Uh, so we, he comes with an excellent track record, and I would expect that a report that he will produce will be of a high standard, and therefore it would be very foolish of us, having uh, commissioned such a report, not to pay attention to what is in it. Well, Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, in, Minister, in your answer to my Lager Valley colleague, Trevor Lundner, I am not sure if you are still committed, um, as, as stated in the climate bill that you intend to bring forward, to have zero emissions by 2050. I mean, I heard you mention a figure there of 82.5 per cent, but I hope that you are still committed and uh, committed to making that target alternatively within your climate bill. Thank you. I am absolutely committed um, to this country, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, reaching 20, zero, net zero by 2050. I am absolutely committed to Northern Ireland making its contribution, as recommended by the independent experts on climate change. Call Jim Allister. Would the Minister clarify, given the governmental system in, with, in which he operates, is he at liberty to bring a bill to this House without the assent of the executive? And if he is not, does that not mean that his best intentions, which are far preferable to what we have before us presently, uh, can be stymied by other political parties, most particularly Sinn Féin, simply declining to give assent? Uh, not, not a lot of truth in what the member says. The problem for Sinn Féin, though, is that this probably impacts upon the farming community that they represent more than any other, uh, because it is uh, more likely to impact upon hill farms and marginal land most, because the land that will have the lowest carbon footprint will be the, the more the lowlands. So Sinn Féin talk a lot about hill farmers. Talk about a lot about people who are operating on farms which have, are marginal in terms of the quality of the land, but Sinn Féin don't seem to mind turning those farmers over on this particular issue, and that's something for them to reflect upon whenever they block my bill and support something which is going to do demonstrable harm to the people that they purport to represent. I call Tagla Magalier. Um, the can call you, uh, cash over all. Question number two. I have secured an initial allocation of five and a half million, two and a half million of resource and three million capital for the 2021-22 Tackling Rural Poverty and Social Isolation Programme, which will support a range of interventions that are consistent with the programme's objectives and intended outcomes of the TRIPSI framework. I recently approved the 2021-22 TRIPSI Programme Action Plan, which builds on the success of working collaboratively collaboratively with other government departments, statutory agencies and the community and voluntary sector. The plan reflects the important role that TRIPSI programme budget will play in sustaining existing initiatives and in promoting the development of new approaches. The resource funding will support 
and <coughs> the Rural Community Development Support Services, the Rural Support Charity, the Assisted Rural Travel Scheme, the Family Farm Health Checks Programme, the Social Farming Support Service, Social Prescribing and Employability Schemes. The TRIPSI programme will also fund capital projects which enhance and develop rural recreation facilities such as forest parks and community trails. The Rural Micro Capital Grant Scheme will support community and voluntary sector projects to address localised poverty and isolation issues, while the Rural Business Development Grant Scheme will support the sustainability of rural businesses, other collaborative projects focusing on the regeneration of villages, the use of rural schools as community facilities and increased access to buildings for persons with disabilities will continue this year. Supplementary, Daglan Magalier. Um, Graham Hogan, I thank the Minister for his answer. And I'm sure the Minister will agree with me that in terms of the overall budget, that, that the, the TRIPSI programme is a modest amount, but it's an, it's an example of how a modest amount can go a long way. Will the Minister um, agree with me that the, a well-funded TRIPSI programme is going to be essential to enable rural community organisations and rural communities at large to emerge from the COVID pandemic? Graham Hogan. Well, that's why I've secured the, the provision that we have, and uh, that is a, a demonstration of our commitment to the rural community, uh, which goes beyond the, the agriculture sector, and a demonstration that we can assist rural communities in a very tangible way in conjunction with other key bodies. So, for example, the Farm Family Health Checks will be carried out in conjunction with the Trusts. Much of the work that we will do uh, will be done in conjunction with local government. Uh, so there is, is considerable uh, work that, that we can achieve in terms of levering additional money um, through the TRIPSI funding, uh, which can significantly boost uh, those uh, rural communities to an even greater extent. Can I ask the Minister what measures does his department use to assess rural poverty and social isolation and loneliness, and how successful do those measures show his programme has been to date? All of the uh, measures that we have identified um, have been addressed significantly um, as a result of the programme. So we have been you know, <coughs> targeting communities uh, where isolation is a significant problem. And a lot of that funding that was used, particularly during um, the COVID period, uh, where we entered into agreement, for example, uh, with uh, the Department for Infrastructure on the Rural Transport Scheme, to ensure people continue to, to get food and continue to get medicines um, who were vulnerable, isolated, <coughs> and because of COVID, uh, who previously would have used that transport to travel to town, were actually able to have that um, to bring uh, produce to them. There has been a whole series of schemes which involves the, the, the better utilisation um, of public buildings uh, to ensure that, uh, that they are, for example, schools. Uh, to ensure that they are used for other purposes um, other than education. And we have been able to support um, educational providers um, with iPads and with uh, digital technology, uh, particularly uh, during COVID, on the back of COVID, uh, to ensure that children in rural communities um, had that opportunity to continue their education uh, even uh, whenever they could not travel to school as a consequence of COVID. I call Sean Lynch. The Concordia Care Seven Three, Question Three. Last November, I stated my belief that the decision of the independent panel a review of decisions cases should be final. My officials are working to put in place the necessary legislation, and a consultation document will be published shortly. The tenure of the current panel <coughs> ends in January 2022, and the consultation document will ask for, review, for views on the makeup of a future panel, given its decision-making role. Under the legislation that is in place, I have decided that I will make the final decision in all cases coming from an independent panel. As of May uh, 2021, there are 108 ongoing applications for a case officer review of decisions. There are further 51 ongoing applications for an independent panel assessment. Of these, 36 have a panel pending, while officials are preparing submission for my final decision for 15 businesses following the independent panel assessment. Sean Lynch, supplementary. As an aggression, thank the minister for his answer. Um, minister, as somebody who represents a rural constituency, this issue can affect and impact on uh, farmers' mental health. 
Will the Minister and his department, with, with other agencies, lessen the, and mitigate the impact on farmers? Well, uh, unlike uh, previous ministers um, who actually overturned many of the panel appeals, I haven't. So I'm accepting the decisions of the independent panel because I don't see the point in having an independent panel who um, deal with appeals and then for a minister, such as um, Minister O'Neill and Minister Gildern, you strike out uh, the decision of the independent panel and take the advice of the civil servants who rejected the farmers in the first instance. So you can be very grateful that it's a DEP ministry he has now and uh, they reflect upon the views of the panel as opposed to Sinn Féin ministers who uh, very often rejected the views of the panel. I call Rosemary Barton. Minister, you've, you've just said there that you will uphold the decisions made by the independent panel. Can I ask you, uh, will that be backdated, say, to 2016, 15, etc.? I, I hadn't planned to backdate it. Uh, I felt that I have a responsibility for the decisions that I make. Um, I have a responsibility for the, the decisions that previous ministers made. I call John O'Dowd. Can I call you Case Ever Care? Question four, please. Following extensive investigations by Lux Agency, they are confident that the source of pollution has been identified and stopped. Analytical results from the Northern Ireland Environment Agency laboratories are now awaited, and this will determine the next steps for the Lux Agency. As with all of the investigations of this nature, details remain sub judice until their formal conclusion, and this being the case, I am unable to comment further. General Dyson, mm -hmm. Madre. Minister, given the significance of the fish kill in this incident and too many other incidents in relation to pollution of whether it's uh, riverways, lakes or locks, does the Minister believe that the protections and the enforcement that is in place is sufficient to protect our uh, natural habitat? Um, these are, are, are tricky issues in that uh, some, of the, some, some of the pollution incidents um, are coming from uh, the, the, our water service, and that has improved fairly dramatically. Uh, we then have some industry pollution incidents, and they have proved inevitably, are, are in, invariably very difficult uh, to actually identify the source of, and that has been particularly problematic in places like Six Mile Water, where there has been quite a regular number of incidents, um, but an inability to actually identify the source because you, you follow, you follow the, the pollution and then it takes you to a large industrial estate and, and it's hard to identify once it gets there. Um, the agricultural ones, uh, there has been a, a substantial improvement, uh, but there's more to do. and We will continue to um, educate uh, in the first instance uh, and enforce in the second instance. But I much prefer the educational route than the enforcement route. Um, uh, enforcement is whenever a failure has happened, and we want to avoid failure happening. I call Justin McNulty. Minister, when was the last time a prosecution was brought forward by NIEA or the Locks Agency following a fish kill? I haven't got the, the detail of when the last time was, but I know that there are many uh, cases brought forward. And uh, that is, it, it is, it is very usual for this to happen. Uh, they are reported on a regular basis uh, whenever that happens, so people know uh, of the costs that can be involved. And it can be very hefty because there is full cost recovery um, for the incident. Uh, so people aren't talking uh, in usually about hundreds of pounds; they're talking at many thousands of pounds and sometimes uh, five-figure sums. Roy Beggs. Mr. Speaker. The Minister has alluded to the fact that there can be a wide range of sources of pollution, and that can also include the, the water service. Given that our sewage system is, uh, in many areas is at capacity already, can the Minister advise, has, there, has he been involved in any discussions at executive level regarding solving the impasse with the water service so that pollution does not continue to be uh, released and affecting the quality of our rivers? Yes, I have met directly with uh, the DFI minister on this issue, and I have to say we need to be very careful in terms of the area plans that local authorities are producing, 
that they are actually taking full cognizance of the ability uh, of the water service to deal uh, with the sewage uh, uh, arising uh, from new developments. And I'm not exactly sure that that is the case. So <coughs> that, that, uh, that is an area that really needs to be looked at and addressed. Uh, I have supported at the executive of additional funding for uh, Northern Ireland Water um, because it's absolutely critical that there is more investment in the capital infrastructure. It's not the most popular thing to invest in. Sewage pipes and water pipes are all underneath the ground. It's not a new school, it's not a new hospital. People don't see it, but there is a really significant benefit of it. And it's important that the Northern Ireland Executive continues to invest in good quality sewage and water infrastructure, which will help ensure that our environment um, is maintained at a high level. Our permission, Mr. Speaker, I wish to group questions six and nine together. My department has commenced preparations for a new Northern Ireland biodiversity strategy, which will take account of the international post 2020 targets on biodiversity. These targets will, will be discussed at the forthcoming international meeting, known as the Conference of Parties, COP15, to the Convention of Biological Diversity. The COP15 meeting is scheduled for 11 to 24 of October 2021 in Kunming, China. A major feature of COP15 will be the agreement to protect 30 per cent of the planet by 2030, often referred to as the 30 by 30 target. I endorse this 30 by 30 target, and my department is considering how best to achieve it. Protecting and restoring biodiversity in Northern Ireland is a long-term commitment. The actions we take now will enable Northern Ireland to meet the overarching global 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. I recognise the importance of encouraging biodiversity in the urban environment priority habitats such as rivers, ponds and open mosaic habitat on previously developed land, underlining the importance of habitats in urban areas and the need to promote those special places for nature. My department is involved in a number of initiatives to promote urban biodiversity, including the, the promotion of the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan and working with local communities to create and protect habitats for pollinators, such as urban pollinator-friendly planting and sustainable parks management. Keep Northern Ireland beautiful and eco schools both work to inform, support and promote biodiversity and habitat creation and receive funding from the department to carry out their work. DARE works with local councils to advise on the development of biodiversity strategies, green infrastructure plans, designation of local nature reserves and conservation actions to support biodiversity and habitat creation and conservation in urban areas. The Department also gives advice to the public on wildlife-friendly gardening, recognising the importance of urban gardens and providing a refuge for biodiversity. Thank you. And, uh, Key Vargeball, supplementary. Um, I thank the Minister for the comprehensive answer. Um, there have been a number of studies, including the State of Nature report, the National Biodiversity Forum report and the Birds of Conservation Concern Ireland report, that have shown a very worrying trends in our biodiversity. The um, State of Nature report showed that 11 per cent of species assessed were under threat of extinction on the island of Ireland. So would the Minister agree that in that context that we are experiencing a, a biodiversity crisis? I, I absolutely recognise that we need to do more in biodiversity and that is one of the reasons why um, I have commissioned a peatland strategy, for example. And <clears throat> that strategy is, is close to completion and will be made public. Um, during this session of, of the Assembly. And, uh, that is an important piece of work for a, a very large part of our biodiversity, not an only part, but a very large part. Other areas that we do need to look at is pollinators, uh, how we can encourage pollination both in an urban setting and indeed uh, in the agricultural setting, and ensure that uh, we can continue to promote um, wildlife biodiversity uh, right across uh, our country. I have time for a very brief question and response, please. Pamela, Pam, Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his um, very detailed answer there. And obviously, there is a great renewed interest in biodiversity, especially given the, the, the last year that we have been in. Can the Minister uh, tell us a bit more about what actions he is taking to increase overall biodiversity? My department commenced um, preparations for a new Northern Ireland biodiversity strategy which will implement the international post-2020 targets in biodiversity, which will be agreed when the Conference of Parties um, COP15 meet later this year. 
So protecting and restoring biodiversity uh, in Northern Ireland is a long-term commitment, and the actions we take now will enable Northern Ireland to meet the overarching Global 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature, which is critically important. And that ends the period for a list of questions, members, and we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Orlea Flynn. Um, Minister, uh, in a written response to my colleague Paul Maskey last week, um, you have shared our party's serious concerns around the foul and offensive odour that is coming from the Mulliglass landfill site, which residents will be living with now for a number of years. Um, can you commit today to looking into the possibility of closure of the site um, and into launching an independent investigation? Um, yes, I have plans to, to visit the site in, in the near future, and I recognise that there has been substantial complaints ha have come um, from, from the residents in that area, and that it is not um, something which I believe is a tolerable situation. Uh, and therefore, I want to ensure that you know either we get on top of the, the, the smell problem, the odour problem. Uh, or indeed, we, we do look at, at uh, the suspension of activities at the site. Supplementary, Orlea Flynn. Yep, um, and I thank the Minister for um, his response, and I'm glad to hear that he's gone out onto that site visit. Also, in his letter, um, he did mention that the health implications are of the utmost concern to him. And although the PHA have advised that unpleasant smells are not known to be harmful to health, the PHA have actually also says, Minister, um, that the, the problem of persistent odours can cause headaches and nausea, and that extreme smells and unpleasant odours could certainly lead to mental health issues. And all of the above um, has been reported from local residents. So it's just what your maybe your opinions on that that there is health implications that's being caused to residents, and just to give that firm reassurance that you will try and um, get this sorted. Thank you. Well, I, I, can't, I can't make a statement on, on the health implications because it is the public health agency that um, gives the advice, and it's the health minister uh, makes those statements. Mm -hmm. uh, I hear what people are saying, um, and we will pass that information on uh, to the Department of Health, to the public health agency, for their further investigation. Uh, but we do have to take the advice um, as our department um, from the, the experts in, in public health. I call Colin McGilderney. Well, good, can I call you? Um, Minister, you will be aware that the European Commission has called for the North to be included in the, in the Irish grass-fed beef PGI application. Does the Minister join me in welcoming that development? Yes. Supplementary, Colin McGilderney. And Minister, you will be aware of the additional value, uh, up to 20 per cent, some evidence indicates, in terms of the, the value of our beef output, which would be welcomed. But also, the carbon footprint of our grass-fed cattle is much, no, much lower than the global average. So would the Minister agree that the, an All-Ireland PGA status would play a key role in recognising the fact that we have the most climate-friendly beef in the world here in the island of Ireland? I am delighted to hear the member uh, making the argument that I was making in the previous question time that it would be ludicrous to shift beef production from Northern Ireland to less carbon friendly places in the world, and therefore uh, that the legislation that is before us uh, is unwise. Um, but in terms of uh, the issue that he raises, yes, we th I think we should be looking to identify every marketing opportunity that exists. So I support the, the PGI uh, Irish grass fed uh, status. Um, and I believe that there is a potential for uh, a British grass-fed status, which we may be able to apply to as well. And um, I don't really care who gives us the highest price for our beef. I'll be very happy to take uh, the highest price for beef anywhere in the world if I can get it from my farmers. Um, the minister is due to take up a very important role uh, shortly, and I, I wish him all the best in it. Um, Given the importance of north-south working, um, and indeed he has emphasised one key element of that, and that is the agri-food sector, um, can he confirm that he will not obstruct any further north-south meetings? I remain uh, committed, Mr Speaker, to all of my duties um, as a minister uh, in this devolved assembly. Okay, Stella, I'll pass my supplementary question. Um, 
Yes, glad to hear that because um, some of those elements, for example, exports from the North to the Republic in 2017 amounted to 2.17 billion, and indeed 600 million litres uh, were traversed the, the, the border for uh, processing in creameries and other places in 2015. So, therefore, will the Minister accept that trade and business development and indeed food safety promotion, which he has mentioned there, as an issue which could be at risk due to a race to the bottom in, in other trade deals will be very important. I consider our relationships north south to be very important, and that is um, why, as a minister, uh, I, I very quickly uh, made the decision, uh, for example, to open the facility at, a, at the radiotherapy uh, centre in Alt McGelvin Hospital, which provided cancer care for people on both sides of the border. It is why Whenever it became obvious that we could not uh, carry on paediatric cardiac surgery in Northern Ireland um, because we were not going to be able to have a surgical team in place, that I came to an agreement to have that in Dublin. So, working on a north south basis on issues which are for the benefit of the people of Northern Ireland that I represent is something that I remain totally committed to doing and will continue to do, uh, whether that be through north south bodies or um, outside of north south bodies. I would say this, though. Relations between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland have never been worse, because the Republic of Ireland, uh, led by Mr Faradkar and Mr Coveney in particular, sought to create barriers between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, our main trading partner. And as a consequence of that, every home is being damaged. And on the executive's papers, the red boxes are all there for health. So in every area of health, in medical devices and in medicines, we are in the red zone, and that is a zone that we have been put there as a result of the protocol, which was driven very heavily by uh, the former Taoiseach in Tonista. So Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland relations are very bad, and they need to be fixed. But we need to get some reassurances that we are going to get somewhere considerably better than we currently are in terms of protocol to fix those relations. Call Keith Buchanan. So far for his answers. Minister, given the imposition of the protocol in Northern Ireland as a result of the agreement between the United Kingdom and the European Union, which has now been legislated for in UK domestic law, would the Minister highlight the costs that that incurs on his staff at the ports? Um, we would be happy to. So, over the course of the last uh, year, um, since June 2020, we have developed um, the costs. And the costs for vets, including managers, is £5,271,696. The other ancillary staff provided by DERA is £6,324,902. And the environmental health officers and ancillary staff provided by the district councils is some £12,848,034, uh, bringing us to a total of £24,440,632. Buchanan, supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Yet again, this is another example of the unacceptable nature of the protocol and the need for the protocol to be replaced in challenges. These figures are staggering and only well in the commenced of this. What steps are you taking to right this wrong? And which has been outside of the control of the Northern Executive? Well, one of the wrongs that has been uh, demanded of us of the European Union is that all of these costs are passed to business. And of course, when the grace period ends, these costs will spiral considerably because we will be moving uh, to what the Department is, 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 is re suggesting some 15,000 checks per week, which is considerably greater than what we are doing now. So these costs will absolutely spiral. Meanwhile, the European Union is saying that we need to pass these costs on to business. And do you know what, who actually pays whenever we can't pass the costs on to business? The consumers. And that's why I have repeatedly said to this Assembly that this protocol will hurt every single individual in Northern Ireland, be they consumers who will have their costs driven up in the shops, be they consumers who are told, actually, we don't supply Northern Ireland anymore because it's too small a market and there are too many complications, or be it uh, consumers who need health care and who need the use of medical devices, and our health service will not be able to provide them 
because of an ill-thought protocol which is doing fundamental damage to every single person in Northern Ireland and will do fundamental damage to every single person in Northern Ireland going forward if unchecked. So I will continue to press hard uh, with the UK government uh, the issues that are at stake here. And the benefits that I have is that the case is unarguable that this protocol is bad for Northern Ireland. And the people who actually previously called for the rigorous implementation of it have went very quiet about seeking the rigorous implementation of it. SDLP, Sinn Féin, Alliance Party. Not too many calling for rigorous implementation now. People are recognising the harm that they have done. Now we need those people Members, two to actually up. stand up and say, we don't want this protocol either. Thank you. I call Gemma Dolan. The Minister will be aware of the recent decision by the Rural Women's Network to close for a period of two weeks, citing workload and limited resources um, as some of the key issues. Does the Minister agree that the pandemic has amplified the divide between urban and rural on a range of matters, including access to services, broadband and fewer opportunities for key workers to work from home in industries such as food processing? Well, our food processing sector continues to grow, and, and we're, we're delighted to support it in so many ways. And, and I have just launched a, a significant investment in CAFRI. Um, the greater part of that actually being in food processing, some £43 million, um, to the Lockery campus in Cookstown. And, uh, we are absolutely committed uh, to ensuring that rural communities don't suffer um, as a consequence of not having the same opportunities. So, Project Stratum is something which DERA is, is uh, contributing to, some £15 million pounds of an overall £200 million pound package, uh, delivered as a result of the confidence and supply deal uh, done by the Democratic Unionist Party, which will help ensure that people in rural communities um, are not disadvantaged um, because we actually care about them. Supplementary, Jan Dolan. Uh, Minister, given the disparity between urban and rural and the impact this has, does the Minister agree that all departments must implement the rural needs duty to ensure that rural communities are not disadvantaged when it comes to accessing government funding? Yes, and that's one of the reasons that I'm opposed to uh, the, the climate change bill that your party is supporting, because it hasn't went through um, the rural needs assessment uh, whenever it has come before us, and your party is supporting it in spite of that not being in place. Call Joanne Bundy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the Minister outline what discussions he's had with the Justice Minister to progress a register for animal cruelty, please? The Justice uh, Minister and myself uh, met earlier this month to discuss that very issue. Supplementary to Juan Bundy. Thank the Minister for his uh, short and sweet answer on that. Uh, could I ask him um, what are his plans to strengthen the laws? around such cruelty, around animal welfare, and a time frame for the progression of such an animal cruelty register, please? I am very keen to see these laws progressed. I am very keen to see us getting to a circumstance uh, where people who have been uh, cruel to animals um, have their names associated with it. Therefore, whenever local councils uh, would be looking at applications for dog licences or for people who are keeping dogs, they can very quickly assess whether these individuals are suitable people um, to be keeping animals. Uh, we are, seem to have some issues in terms of the Department of Justice um, and the sharing of information. Uh, I believe that if people have engaged in criminal activities which have involved in cruelty to animals, there should be no hiding place for them. And I would hope that the Department of Justice um, will find a way of working with us. I think there is a greater degree of willingness perhaps than there was. But they will find a way of working with us to ensure that animal cruelty is something that we can, number one, identify who engages in it, and number two, ensure that those people who do engage in it don't have the opportunity to persist in their activities by allowing them to keep animals going forward in the future. Time is up. Can members please take your ease for a moment or two?